Welcome to the distinguished lecture in electrical and computer engineering in the Financial Services Analytics Program. Uh, it's, it's a pleasure to welcome Ant Antonio Ortega to, to our campus to give this uh, distinguished lecture. Uh, Antonio uh, received a telecommunications engineering degree from the University Politecnica de Madrid um, and the PhD, the PhD in electrical engineer from Columbia University through a Fulbright program. He joined, after that, he joined the University of Southern California where he went through the ranks and now he's a professor of electrical engineering and also he was a director of the Signal and Image Processing Institute, a very well recognized institute in the, in the imaging field. He has many, many awards. I don't want to list all of them, but he has, he has received the NSF Career Award. He was elected Fellow of the IEEE for many of his contributions. He has been uh, Associate Editor of the IEEE Transactions on Image Processing and many other journals of the IEEE. But overall, his research interests are in the areas of digital image and signal processing and lately of uh, data science. Uh, he is one of the leading researchers in the emerging area of graph signal uh, processing, uh, which is a, a, the topic of his lecture today. So without further ado, please join me in uh, welcoming Antonio to UD. Hi, everybody. Thanks uh, for the introduction and thanks for inviting me. This was uh, a great uh, opportunity to visit and I had lots of very interesting conversations. Uh, throughout the day and hopefully after the talk uh, uh, as well. And uh, as Gonzalo said, this is you know, basically a lot of my research in the last few years. And what I chose to do today was to give you sort of a high level overview of what it means. Uh, I mean, maybe this will be uh, um, more intuitive for some of you in signal crossing, but hopefully I'll give you enough insights on, on what we're doing with graphs, um, even if you're not in that area. I always start with uh, uh, listing collaborators and I actually collaborate uh, with a lot of people in different universities, including universities in Europe and in Japan. And of course, uh, my students, uh, uh, without whom none of this would happen, and uh, they're, uh, you know, many of them uh, have graduated, moved on, and uh, funding from uh, several sources, but in particular NSF and, and several companies. All right, so as an outline, um, I'll, I'll give you some motivation, tell you what uh, graph signal processing is, is and then, will sort of mimic what um, uh, you might be doing in, in a signal processing class. We'll define what a frequency is in, for uh, signals on graphs. We'll talk about uh, transforms and filters. Then we'll talk about sampling of graph signals. And then we talk about how to learn the graphs from data. And what I'll try to do is give you, in each of these cases, examples of applications. And I won't go in, in depth in the applications, just give you a flavor of how this can be used in, in various settings. So that's, uh, that's going to be the outline. So as a motivation, I think if you look at uh, a lot of what's happening uh, today, um, you, know, you can trace that back to Moore's law and what that has done for computing. And so one of the consequences of uh, Moore's law is that it has multiplied the amount of devices and the type of devices that we use for sensing, computing, and, communication, and communicating, right? And so we all walk around with all kinds of these devices, uh, phones, tablets, uh, computers, um, and we're exposed to sensors in various places. Um, and uh, you know, there's uh, a lot of interest in the internet of things and how these sensors can communicate and talk to each other. And so data is being collected everywhere, uh, whether you know it or not, or whether you like it or not, uh, in your interactions online and in the real world. And the, the challenge is turning many of these measurements into data and information, right? They, so going from data to information. Um, there are other challenges that I won't get into. One of them is, of course, privacy. And if you follow the news, uh, you know how important that is and how you know, weak of a position we have on that. So this is data and networks. Now, what I'm interested in here is data that is on networks. And uh, I'm interested in um, two types of networks, both physical networks, and uh, physical networks could be uh, the internet, for example, so that's computers communicating with each other, but also transportation networks, the, the road network, the rail network, uh, utilities, you know, for water, for electricity, 
and uh, uh, networks of sensors, okay? So this is what I call uh, sensor networks and, or, or physical networks. Um, we're also interested in logical networks. So these are networks of information. And so uh, an example would be an online social network and all the data associated to it. Other examples could be uh, the web. But also you can see complex, very complex systems that operate by moving from state to state, um, you know, in, in the system state. And, and those can be also described by networks. And uh, even machine learning problems can be viewed from a network or a graph perspective. And so the, the challenge behind what I've been doing in the last uh, uh, five plus years is how do we take into account the structure of these data sets? So for example, the relative location of the sensors with respect to each other, or the information encoded in a social network, who is connected to whom. So how do you use the structure of the data set to make sense of the information that is available in the network, right? So the temperature that the sensors measures is me are measuring, or some information that the data set, the, the social network is, is capturing. How do we take into account the structure? Um, to make this a bit more concrete, um, if you think of an example of a sensor network, maybe this is um, a temperature, um, a series of temperature sensors that are placed in the environment, but they're not necessarily placed you know, on a grid, right? They're, they're located in different places, they communicate with each other. And so you know the relative position of the sensors and the temperature they're measured. And you would like to ask questions such as, does the temperature vary smoothly across the network, right? So if you go from sensor to sensor to sensor, are you observing the same temperature? Or do you see anomalies? Uh, do you see different behaviors that you're not expecting based, based on what you know of, of the environment? Um, similarly, in a social network, so again, a, a logical network, and there's a lot of information that is captured there. Uh, maybe this information about, uh, do you have information about your connections, but you also know the age, you know, income, other, other information about each of the users. And you would ask, uh, would, I, would I like to ask a question, are uh, people who are friends in a social network of similar age? Okay, again, you can think of this in terms of smoothness. If I go from one node to another node in the social network, is the information similar from node to node to node, right? So both of these questions involve data, in one case temperature, in the other case, you know, age or income or, or whatever. Um, but they also involve tying the data to the structure of the, the network that you're observing the data in. And that, that's the problem that graph signal processing uh, is addressing. Now, if you want a one slight summary, uh, you know, maybe one line summary of what signal, graph signal processing is doing, uh, we're given a graph. It's either fixed or, or learned, and I'll introduce what the graph is. We are given signals that live on that graph, that, uh, so that's the data that we're trying to analyze. And uh, then we define notions of frequency, of transforms, filters, and sampling. I'll describe examples of all of this. And then we want to use that to solve problems such as compressing the data on the graph, denoising it, finding out liars, doing classification, uh, interpolation, sampling, and so on. Uh, I'll point you to several overview papers, including one that, that is going to appear in May that we just uh, finished uh, recently. Uh, there's two textbooks coming up. And uh, in this area, if you want to get started, there's actually very good uh, uh, MATLAB and Python toolboxes. So you can try a few of these things that I'll describe here um, you know, with code that is already available. Okay, so that's, that's kind of a summary. Now, the starting point for graph signal processing is defining a notion of uh, frequency, right? And um, we'll walk you through, uh, through that. So if you, before a few definitions, um, so we're going to define a, a graph. This is an example of a graph that has n vertices and some edges. Um, in what I'll describe today, uh, all these graphs have positive weighted uh, edges these edges measure similarity between the nodes. And so two nodes that are not connected, you view them as not being very similar. And two nodes that are connected will be more similar the, the larger the weights are, right? So think of the edge weights as being a similarity metric between uh, the, the nodes. Um, the graph signal for us is going to be a series of scalars that are associated to each of the, uh, the nodes of the graph. Uh, you could extend this to vectors, but for the purpose of today's uh, talk, let's assume that we have one scalar value in each of these points. 
And you can imagine that this is a flexible model for representing data in, in different problems. And in particular, for the two examples that I had before, a sensor network or a social network so, such as Facebook, you can view each of them as a graph, right? Of very different scales, right? The Facebook graph is maybe two billion users. Uh, a sensor network may have hundreds of sensors, but both are undirected. You can associate, um, in some cases, weights. Uh, in some cases, the weights would be either zero or one. So it captures many different problems. And we're going to do our analysis based on algebraic representations of these uh, graphs. And uh, uh, these may be uh, familiar to some of you. Uh, we start with the adjacency matrix. If we have n vertices, basically it's an n by n matrix where the ij entry is non-zero if the two, those two nodes are connected. So, and if the graph is undirected, um, we have that aij is equal to aji. So each entry in the adjacency matrix is the edge weight. If the entry is zero, that means that those two nodes are not connected. And so typically what we, we'd expect is uh, a matrix that is relatively sparse, where you know, not, not every node is connected to every node, right? Um, from the adjacency matrix, we derive the degree matrix, and the degree is basically the sum of all the weights arriving at one node, right? So think of it as in the Facebook graph, your weight is uh, the number of friends you have. So maybe I'm a lightweight here, and maybe some of you are heavyweights, but the, the, the degree will give you the, the total number of connections you have, right? If the, if the graph is, is a weighted graph, you would sum all the weights of all the incoming edges. Um, there are various ways to go from uh, these definitions to um, a frequency definition, and we're gonna use the one that is based on the combinatorial graph Laplacian. This is simply the degree minus the adjacency matrix. And uh, I'll just say that working with uh, directed graphs is, is more complicated, and uh, I won't say much about them today. And uh, so you can expect all the graphs that we will consider today to be undirected um, positive weights. Okay, so the Laplacian matrix, degree minus adjacency. So how do we go from that to a notion of frequency? We do that by uh, taking the uh, eigenvectors of that matrix. And so we can represent this matrix as uh, these two eigenvector matrices, U transpose U. Uh, so this is the eigenvectors, and uh, lambda has diagonal terms. In the case of this uh, transformation, the, the uh, terms are these lambda values are the frequencies, and they're all positive and real, okay, for this case. And so we call this um, eigenpair system, the lambda, the eigenvalue, U, the eigenvector, we call this the basically the Fourier basis for, for the graph signals. And without uh, permission from Fourier, we, we, will, we call this the graph Fourier transform. I don't know if Fourier would be happy about this, but I guess he cannot complain. Um, so this is what we call the graph Fourier transform. Now, why, why do we call this the graph Fourier transform? Uh, because it captures a, a notion of frequency. Now, so let me get a little bit more mathematical about this, to, to, but to give you some insights. When you compute the eigenvalues and eigenvectors, uh, if you go back to your linear algebra, you solve a, um, an optimization um, which involves the Rayleigh quotient. So you, um, if you have selected the eigenvectors one through k minus one, you're looking for an eigenvector that is orthogonal to all the previous ones, and that minimizes this quantity, okay? So U transpose L U. L, remember, is the Laplacian, right? So that's derived directly from the graph. Okay, so how do we interpret this? Well, first of all, the first eigenvalue is zero, and the first eigenvector is one. That's our lowest frequency, okay? So the frequency is zero, and that means that all the, the, the values in the graph are the same, they're all one. Okay, if you look at this U transpose LU, this is the shape it has. It's a sum of, for all the nodes J that are neighboring to I, of Wij, Ui minus Ij, Square, ui and uj are the values of the eigenvector at the two nodes i and j, and this is the weight between the two. So I'm gonna say that this quantity measures the variation of a signal in the graph. The minimum variation signal is one, right? There's no variation, every node is the same. Uh, once you find values that, have, that are orthogonal to one and then to u2 and so forth, you're finding signals that have increased variation while being orthogonal to the previous one. Okay, 
So what does increased variation in the graph um, actually mean? I'll give you an example. So in the graph that I had before, this is the first uh, eigenvector. So you can see up here that all the values are constant, right? Zero variation, constant. If you go to the next one, you can see that now some of the nodes are positive, some of the nodes are negative. Okay, so there's more variation. But notice that almost every positive node has positive neighbors, and almost every negative node has negative neighbors. Okay, so that means that there's more variation than here, but not that much variation. If you go to the highest frequency, you can see that every positive node is likely to have at least one negative neighbor. Okay, so when you put all this together, you get a frequency representation where you go to from low frequency, smooth, low variation, to high frequency, a lot of variation from node to node, right? And so for example, if you went back to the question about um, are friends on Facebook likely to have a similar age, you could take the age signal on Facebook, and if most of the energy is here in these few bases, then the answer is likely yes, right? Because then you know, your, your representation with uh, low frequency bases captures most of the energy, okay? So I could go on and about this. There's lots of open questions actually on, on whether this is really a good uh, definition for frequency, but I think it's, it's a reasonable definition for frequency and this is the more, most widely adopted now. So you, what you have to remember is low frequency means low variation of, on the graph. High frequency means very high variation, rapid variation on the graph. Okay, I want to give a, a few examples to, to link this to things that are familiar. And, and so to do that, if you take an example of a cycle graph, okay, so that's a very simple uh, graph. This is what the Laplacian looks like. Remember that Laplacian is degree minus adjacency. So every node here has degree two, right? Every node has two neighbors. And there's two connections, one to the left, one to the right. So this is exactly the, the shape of the graph Laplacian. In this case, the, this matrix is circulant. So for those of you in signal processing, the uh, eigenvectors of this matrix are the discrete Fourier transform. And this is indeed the one that Fourier did you know, introduce. Um, the other thing that I wanted to point out is that if you multiply this matrix by a signal x, uh, this operation L times X is actually one hop operation. It basically means if, uh, taking an average between one point at one node and the two neighbors, right? So the Laplacian is a one hop operation. In the case of a circular cycle graph, it corresponds to the DFT. Um, now if you change one thing, you know, just one thing, now it becomes completely different, right? So this matrix is no longer circling. The DFT is no longer the eigenvectors. We can no lo are no longer in you know, conventional Fourier uh, theory. But this Laplacian is still one hop operator. So it's still, you know, every operation you do multiplying L by something corresponds to doing one hop operator in the graph. That means, you know, that all you need to know is one node and its neighbors, okay? Um, and there's still a frequency interpretation associated to this. Um, just as a side note, if we actually remove one, one of the edges in this, we end up with a discrete cosine transform, which is what uh, all of you are using when you capture a JPEG image to post somewhere, right? So your JPEG, your image encoding uh, is all working with the DCT transform, and that's corresponding to a graph with only one, one edge removed. Okay, so as a summary, we have different types of graphs, directed, undirected. I'm focusing on directed graphs here. Multiple algebraic representations, but the one to keep in mind is Laplacian. That's what I'll talk about today. And hopefully I'll give you enough idea that there's a, you know, there's a notion of frequency that is associated to, to these eigenvectors. And uh, remember that these polynomials, if you multiply a vector by the Laplacian, you get a, it's a one-hop operation. So I want to illustrate this with an example where uh, what we did was we, we collaborated with colleagues in, uh, in the medical school uh, to use video to evaluate uh, uh, medication status of Parkinson's disease uh, patients, right? And so basically Parkinson's disease manifests itself through, through motion. And so you can ask um, the patients to do certain tasks, right? Walk across the room, uh, sit down, sit up, right? And stand up. And uh, you, you can observe the motion and try to determine whether the, the level of medication is, is an accurate one. So in this case, what we do is uh, 
we use the uh, Kinect or some other tools to, to analyze video. And these methods give us uh, motion associated to a skeleton, right? To the skeleton graph where you connect the joints in, in, in the body. Okay, so in this case, we have an unweighted graph. It's a, you know, it's a graph that, that you, know, you can recognize. Um, and to make the, the, the notions of um, frequency a bit more concrete, if you look at uh, two um, eigenvectors or two bases of the graph Fourier transform, uh, this would be the second one, this would be the third one. And so you can see that the first one, uh, the, sec the second in this case, captured motion where the upper body and the lower body go in different directions, right? Because one is po values are positive in the upper body, negative in the lower body. Um, well, this one captures symmetric motion, right, where left arm and right leg move in the same direction, okay? So how well does this work? What can we do with it? So I'll give you a, uh, an example where this is not a Parkinson's disease patient. This is one of my students, and we capture video, and she's doing some, you know, some uh, motion. And what we did is, without knowing anything about the motion, we tried to segment what she was doing by, by just... Uh, taking the graph Fourier transform of the data on that graph, and then um, uh, basically determining when there is uh, you know, a change. And what you see at the top is one eigenvector, uh, one projection, this is uh, another one. And you can see that they discriminate in different types of motion. So the first few motions are upper body only, and then at some point she starts uh, doing some kicks, and when you have these kicks, they appear in, in the other um, eigenvector, right? And now, none of this needs to be trained. It doesn't require a big data set and deep learning or anything else. We just uh, design uh, these bases that come directly from the structure of the graph. And then, based on these bases, we can do a segmentation into reasonable, you know, re reasonably separate motions. Because these uh, uh, elementary bases reflect the sort of elementary motions by the individual. Okay. So let me move on. All right. So that was the definition of graph frequency. Takeaway message is, you know, you can define matrices related to the graph, and then you can define reasonable frequencies for graph signals. Um, now, once you have a definition of uh, frequency, you can design filters and uh, transformations. Um, and so... I want to start by asking the question, you know, we want to design graph filters or graph transforms. So, you know, we're associating graph to everything, right? And so my question is, what makes a transform a graph transform, right? I mean, if you think about it carefully, these input signals here, after all, they're vectors of, in dimension n, right? I can transform any way I want. I multiply them by some n by n matrix. Uh, so what makes them, what makes a transform that I choose here uh, a graph transform? Um, so what makes them a graph transform are, first of all, the frequency interpretation that, you know, the operation that we do can be diagonalized by, the, you know, these um, um, eigenvector matrices. And we'll talk about how this is analogous to what we do in, in signal processing. And also they're graph transform because the, the transforms are localized in the vertex domain, right? So remember how the Laplacian is a one-hop operation? So we want to design operations that are one-hop or two-hop or three-hop. Right? And this is analogous to what we do in, in signal processing where, where we talk about FIR filters, right? That, that basically look at a signal in time and analyze only you know, in windows that, are, that slide over time. So that means that there are designs for graph transforms that, that are based on uh, vertex domain and transform domain. I'll give you examples of, of these, these kinds of transforms. This, these are uh, vertex domain uh, transforms where um, uh, we, for example, do a one-hop averaging. So, so we look at one node and its neighbors, and we compute the average of all the values, you know, the, one, the, the, the node in the middle and the neighbors. We can also do a one-hop difference. Okay? And this, these were some of the first uh, things that were proposed. Um, so generally, a vertex domain transform is one that works in units of you know, um, looking at neighborhoods of, pixel, of, um, of nodes in the graph. How about uh, the frequency domain? So in the frequency domain, lambda here is the frequency that we defined earlier, and we have a discrete set of uh, frequencies, right? We have n frequencies if we have um, yeah, n nodes. And so we can define, again, an analogy to what's being done in, in signal processing. For every frequency value, we uh, define a, a gain, right? And so in this example, the lowest frequency is zero, highest frequency is two. 
So this, in signal processing terms, would be a low-pass filter, right? So you, you maintain the energy of the low frequencies, but you attenuate the high frequencies, right? And we can do the same thing for, for graph uh, signals. Yeah, to, to take the analogy further, what you're doing here is similar to implementing digital filters uh, using the fast Fourier transform. You know, you first take the data, find the Fourier transform, then you scale the frequencies, right? So a similar idea. In this case, you take the data, you compute the graph Fourier transform, scale the frequencies to the universe. Now, are these two things, are con are these two things connected? It turns out they are in a very interesting way. Um, if the function that describes the frequency response, this is uh, what I call h of lambda, if it's a polynomial of lambda, it turns out that it's also a polynomial, the, the vertex domain representation of that function is also a polynomial of lambda, the, oh, sorry, of the Laplacian L. And so that means that if I choose a response, you know, let's say my initial response is this red line that you barely see, but I approximate it by a polynomial of lambda, then whatever I'm doing in the vertex domain is guaranteed to be local. It's guaranteed to be a you know, K-hop operation if the polynomial is degree K, right? So in this example, I start with the original filtering that I want to do, um, and then I choose an approximation, let's say, with k equals 8, which gives me this uh, light green curve, and then I know that I have a, a, an 8 hop operation on the graph. That's, that's uh, uh, the idea. So there's, there's a vertex domain and a frequency domain, and there's a connection between the two. Um, this is an example where we take a data set of uh, weather data, and we, let's say, choose a a low-pass filter, you know, for denoising, and after um, we approximate it by a polynomial, then this is the result of denoising. And so, so again, to put this in context, if you if you look at data sets that um, that are defined on ne networks, now you can use many of the same um, ideas that you've used for for signals that are defined in time or for images, right? You can define filtering operations that are adapted to the structure of these uh, data sets. Okay, so that was an example of a single filter. Um, we did some other work to design what are called uh, filter banks, where now we have uh, two filters, let's say a low pass and a high pass filter. We downsample the output of these filters, and then this would be our analysis filter bank, and then we reconstruct, uh, upsample, and then filter. Um, so filter banks uh, have been used, in, in, for example, for audio uh, signal processing. And uh, they've, they're also used uh, for images and many other contexts in signal processing. Um, <clears throat> the, the reason you do downsampling is that you, you don't want to have more data here than you had there, right? So basically through downsampling, these systems are critically sampled. You keep the same number of samples per second. So we designed both orthogonal and biorthogonal filter banks for graph filters. Uh, but these, are, these are work only for bipartite graphs. And I'll just give you examples. When you do the, the analysis for a bipartite graph, you end up solving, solution, solving these problems that are very similar to what's uh, um, done in, in signal processing. Um, so I'll give you just an example. This is a graph that comes from a, a road network, uh, the road network in Minnesota. We created uh, an artificial signal that has two different values, one in this region and another one in this region. And so what we would like to do is to be able to do low-pass filter and high-pass filter on a, a graph signal like this, right? Um, so to do that, we have to do a bipartite decomposition. Let me not go into that detail. But this is an example of what we get, right? Where, remember, the, the, the signal had two constant values. So the, the, the smooth approximation looks very much like the original, right? So it's a reconstruction that where you have a, uh, constant value, almost constant value here and, and another constant value there. The more interesting one is the high-pass filter. The high-pass filter basically identifies where the edges are between those two regions, right? Um, and again, in this case, it's, it's really easy to visualize because, you know, um, the road network in Minnesota is in 2D, right? Uh, you know, it doesn't go into a fourth dimension. Um, and so you can see exactly what's happening by depicting it on, in two dimensions. But if you have data sets that are in much higher dimension, you cannot really visualize it. But you can see with this example that, that the, what a low-pass filter, high-pass filter do is, is, a meaningful, you know, is meaningful, right? It does what you would expect it to do. Okay, so as a summary of what we've done in designing transforms, um, 
remember there's vertex domain approaches, frequency domain approaches, and the polynomials. So polynomials have a special role that they, 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 they sort of give you a connection between the two. If you have a polynomial, then you're localized in, in, in the vertex domain and have an interpretation in the frequency domain. Um, critical sampling is, is possible, but only for special cases. And there are actually lots of open questions, so this is still a pretty active area of, uh, of research, including one thing that, that I think is, is important is, you know, why exactly only, you know, bipartite graphs? I think that's a limitation that, that feels somewhat artificial when investigating what's, uh, why that's the case. Okay, so frequency, we introduce transforms. Another tool that you find in, in the signal processing toolbox is sampling, right? And so sampling, is when you, when you take a uh, you know, digital signal processing course, the, the digital part is because you know, you're sampling you know, something um, uh, continuous time, let's say uh, speech, audio, or, or, or images, you're capturing that, and then you're doing the processing in the, uh, of these discrete points in time space. So it really, it's a core tool, uh, A to D converters, or digital to digital processing. So the question is, when you, when you do the sampling, what are the properties that allow you to do sampling and then reconstruct, right? So for example, if, you're, if you have a, a, a CD player or you have an MP3 file, um, you know, the MP3 file has been sampled at, um, the, uh, sampled the, the audio waveforms at a high enough rate that you can play it, play it back and get the music, right? So what properties enable recovery from the digital samples, how to sample, how to reconstruct? Um, so we want to extend these questions or address these questions in the case of um, graphs as well, right? So going back to the examples that I, that I had earlier, um, if we have a sensor network, for example, instead of probing every sensor in the sensor network at every time, we would like to probe some sensors some of the time, right? To save energy. And so basically we want to s sample the temperature rather than measure it everywhere. Or in a social network, maybe you want to, um, you know, poll the users but you don't want to poll every user, right? You want to decide who you ask and decide in, you know, in, in a way that you maximize the information that you get from their responses. So if you go back to traditional uh, DSP, uh, what you have is if you have a discrete time signal to begin with, if the signal is band limited, right? So if, if at the maximum frequency is, is uh, below some level, in this case pi over m, you can downsample and then you can upsample and interpolate with an LDO filter, and you get back the same signal that you had, right? So this is the sampling in the traditional setting. And the properties that, that make sampling work are that the signals are smooth, therefore they're low frequency. Um, you apply regular sampling, so in this case, you keep every mth sample, right? So you've done sample by two, you keep every other sample. So there's regular sampling. And the reconstruction um, is done via some filtering, okay? So now we want to know how we extend this to graphs, right? So basically similar idea. We have a graph, the, some arbitrary connectivity, and uh, we start with, uh, we want to separate it into two subgraphs, S, which is the, the, the samples that we measure, and S complement is what, what we don't measure, right? And then we're gonna keep only the information on S. And then we will want to figure out what allows us to reconstruct the signal from those samples, right? So in the sensor network case, we want to know if we sample temperature in a few sensors, under what conditions can we recover the exact temperature everywhere, including the sensors we didn't measure, right? That's what we would like to answer. So how is this different from the previous case? Well, first we need to define frequency, just as in the case for regular signal processing. The good news is we have a definition of frequency, so that can be done. Uh, however, how to do sampling, right? In the, in the signal processing case, we said every other sample or every M sample. So that's straightforward, right? It's regular sampling. There's no regular sampling for graphs, right? We, we don't know, there's no such thing as every other node, right? They are, they're not ordering. There's no ordering to the nodes. Um, so this is really the more difficult problem, how to do sampling. And then we do filtering. We just discussed before that we know how to design filters. So we can take any, um, you know, sampled signal and then do a low pass filtering to reconstruct it. So really the key in this problem is to uh, focus on sampling, how to do the sampling. Okay, um, so we developed a method. I'm not gonna get into the details of the method, but I just wanna, you know, maybe build a little bit of intuition of how, how this uh, 
um, sampling works. Um, so here we have the same graph twice, and we have two different sa sampling strategies. So either I keep these three nodes or I keep these three nodes. And so do you have any thoughts on you know, what would be the right strategy in this case in general? What's better? What's worse? Who thinks the first strategy is the best? A few. How about the second strategy? So I think the first strategy wins, and it, it is the better one. And why is it the better one? You can argue this in several ways that are actually tied to, to our algorithm. Um, the first one is that you can see that in, in the first one, every node that you did not observe is one hop away from something that you did observe, right? Um, whereas here, one of the nodes that you did not observe is really far away from one that you did observe. Also, I kind of cheated a little bit. You know, if, I t if you take that graph and you just pull the ends out, you can see it's a line graph, right? So this is actually regular sampling. This is irregular sampling, right? Uh, so um, in our algorithm, the, what we end up doing is choosing uh, nodes so that they're, they're basically separated and so that you, uh, the distance from any node that you did not observe to a node that you observe it tends to be minimized, right? So we tend to spread out the nodes. And I won't go into the details of the algorithm, but that's, that's kind of the general intuition behind it, okay? that, that we do it with methods that are really uh, more algebraic than that. Okay, so a summary of what sampling does before we move to an, an example application. So the, the general sampling formulation is very similar, right? We have a notion of frequency. If the frequency is, is low enough, you can sample and then reconstruct. Um, but there's no such thing as regular sampling, so you have to figure out what is the best way to optimize the sampling position. So the lack of regular structure prevents uh, regular sampling. Um, we have a simplified method. It's a greedy algorithm. I could talk more about this uh, offline. Now, why is this, how is this useful? So we, we, we looked at this and applied it to, uh, to a machine learning problem. And um, this problem is um, um, something called active semi-supervised learning. And so in machine learning, especially nowadays, I mean, I said at the beginning that, that we're collecting a lot of data. Collecting data is relatively easy. Storing data is relatively easy. What's difficult is labeling the data, right? And especially if you need to, to do manual labeling, if you need people to go through and you know, classify things, right? For example, if you have images and you do want to recognize images, right? You need to have somebody who looks at the images and places a label on each of the images, right? So grabbing images is not difficult. Labeling them is very difficult, okay? Um, so in active semi-supervised learning, what you want to do is assuming that you have limited resources to label, right? So you have limited people that can help you label, or you don't have enough money to pay people, or people are not that reliable. You would like to select those uh, examples that you have in the data set that are the m best for labeling, right? Those, those that are the most informative, informative ones. And uh, it has been shown that if you only partially label the data set and you use both label and unlabel data, you're actually doing better than by using only the label data, right? So in semi-supervised learning, you use both label and unlabel data. And so the question that we're focusing on here is what is the optimal set of nodes to label, okay? And so now we approach this the following way. So you have uh, a bunch of, you know, let's say images. You define a distance between the images. So that's a, that's a measure of similarity. Maybe you compute the pixel to pixel distance between the images. And then you create a graph where every node represents an, an image or some other item that you would like to label. And then uh, the, the edge weights between the nodes correspond to the similarity between those, those images. So data points give you nodes, edge widths give you similarity. And then if you were able to label everything, then you would have labels associated to all of these images, right? Maybe you have a dogs versus cats data set, and you, know, you have uh, a label plus one indicates dogs, minus one indicates cats, right? And you have that. So we're gonna treat the labels information as a label, as a signal, right? And so this would be the example. You have that all of these items have the same label, all of these items have the same label, right? So what we would like to do 
is we would like to decide if, in this example, we can dis only label two data points, which should be the ones that we should label, right? So um, now, remember that the sampling that we described before was based on the idea that the signal is low frequency, right? If the signal is smooth or low frequency, then we can sample and reconstruct. If you have an arbitrary signal, it doesn't work, right? And so, you know, if you go back to the audio example, your MP3 has the sampling rate it has because the audio signals that you are capturing are limited in frequency, right? So you need that frequency limitation. Now, if you look at um, several simple examples in the machine learning literature, these are three data sets. This one is uh, images corresponding to handwritten digits. This one is uh, speech, and it's uh, isolated uh, letters uh, spoken. Um, and this is a data set of uh, news groups, um, so it's text. Okay? Now, in each of these cases, what we plotted was we took the class membership function for one label. Okay? So let's say, for example, here we chose the, the digit, digit zero. Right? Then we take the graph that represents all the images, the zeros and the non-zero, and the, the ones and the twos and so forth, creates a single graph, and then we place the information for zero in that, uh, on that graph, and everything that was a zero is plus one, everything that is non-zero is minus one. And we look at the frequency content of that graph signal. And what you see in this example is that when you start from the lowest to the highest, uh, this is the cumulative energy. And so it tells you that to get 90% of the energy of that label signal, uh, you need about 10% uh, of the frequencies, right? So this is a very low pass signal. Uh, the same is true to a lesser degree to the, with the others, right? Now, why is this true? Well, basically, this is true because classification is possible, right? If, you, if, if things are not well separated in that feature space, then you cannot classify, right? But, but in general, it's a good, it's a good assumption that to, to, to think of the label signals as being relatively smooth. Okay, so what we do is we start with, with input data, no labels. We construct the graph as I described. You find a, uh, um, you know, a distance between the nodes. You, you associate them. Then we use the sampling algorithm, which I didn't describe in detail, to select a set of nodes to label. Then we label those. And then we predict the labels by construction. So basically, with, with, with what, we, what we label, we predict everything else in the data set. And this is an example for the three data sets that, uh, that I showed before, uh, USPS, isolated letters, and news group. Um, <clears throat> this is uh, the accuracy of the classifier um, with the, uh, the accuracy of the prediction, rather, with the percentage of data label, right? So the maximum percentage in all these cases is 10%. And you can see that in the, in the easiest uh, data set, which is the uh, handwritten digits, you get to, you know, if you label 10% of the data, um, you get almost 90% accuracy. So that means that by just looking at 10% of the data in, the, in, in that um, data set and this determining for that 10%, whether it's a 0, 1, 2, or et cetera, you can guess to 90% accuracy everything else. But, you know, what I want to emphasize is that our method is significantly better, better, better than state-of-the-art uh, techniques for this, right? Because we take into account the, the, the structure of the graph in a better way than these other methods, right? So this is an example that graph sampling can be useful to, you know, in tasks such as uh, machine learning. Okay, so summary, there are many different applications that use graph in, 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 in the learning context, in particular for semi-supervised learning. But the main novelty in this formulation that I just described is to approach it from a sort of graph signal processing perspective and think of the um, better filters for reconstruction and interpolation, and in particular, think of the sampling. You know, it's a better sampling than other methods used. OK, so we talked about frequency, transforms, sampling. Um, in all of these um, examples that I gave, um, the, the graph was given to us, right? We chose a graph, and that, you know, that, that's, that's what we used. So the problem that I'm um, addressing next is um, what is the best graph to use in a given task, right? So in the cases that I described already, we, it was given. Um, you can argue that if you're analyzing, let's say, um, an online social network, for example, the, the graph itself is part of the data that comes with the, the, the social network, right? So, so that's the graph that you should use, right? That's what the users have decided uh, 
um, should be their connection. But for other approaches, maybe there's a more model-based or data-driven uh, approach to, to, to do this. And so the basic idea behind the algorithm, again, I'm not going to describe the algorithm in a lot of detail. So remember, we've, we've been looking at uh, <clears throat> graph signals, and some are smooth and some are not so smooth on the graph. So what we're going to do is, if we're given the data, we're going to choose a graph such that, on average, the data is smooth on that graph. Okay? That's basically, in a nutshell, what, what we're doing. Um, so in a little bit more detail, uh, we start with a data matrix where um, we have vectors. Each of the vectors um, uh, represents a graph signal. So this is an example, right? At this point, we don't have a graph yet, right? So, but you have you know, e examples of data. Um, you know, for example, if, if we were trying to determine uh, the best uh, graph to associate to a sensor network, Right? You know, maybe in a scientific application, we want to know how the data is related to each other. Uh, what we may do is we may have a bunch of observations um, where we have all the data of the end sensors and we observe this over time. Right? So we have a data matrix, uh, capital X. Then uh, the basic problem is we um, uh, formulate, we assume that these vectors here that, that are realizations, they're, they're observations for each uh, um, in, in all, all the sensors, for example, they, they're part of a Gaussian Markov random field. And uh, we um, associate to that Markov field, random field, a, uh, uh, an inverse covariance that is the, a, the, the generalized Laplacian. Okay, so, uh, you know, to be more specific, S here is the covariance of the data. So this is completely data driven. It measures basically the correlation between the, the, the variables. And what we're looking for is Q, which is going to be an approximation to the inverse of this uh, covariance matrix under some constraints. And we solve a problem like this. It can be shown that this problem is a maximum likelihood estimation problem under some constraints to make this matrix Q a generalized Laplacian. Okay. Okay. So I'll give you some examples of you know how this uh, uh, works in practice. Um, so this is uh, from a Berkeley data set where we have image patches um, that we obtain from this data set, and these are natural images. Um, I guess this has 500 images. You know, this is very small by today's standards, right? Some of the data sets that Google produce have a million images, and some are you know, even bigger than that. It's a relatively small data set, uh, I think mostly meant for segmentation experiments. Now, okay, so what we, what we did is from each of these um, uh, images, we took random 16 by 16 patches, okay? So going back to here, um, each of these vectors is basically 16 by 16 pixels, so 256 pixels that are um, collected from random patches in all these images. So when we do this covariance matrix, um, we're looking at uh, an average of, um, you know, the, the correlation between those pixels. Right? So we look at the, the correlation between pixels in one patch, and we average that over all the patches. Okay. So now when we run the algorithm, we um, extract a model that is uh, uh, forced to be sparse, and this is the, the model that we get represented as a grid. So I think the, the interesting part is that what we obtain as, a, as the right model for these images is actually a grid. And any of you who's been doing uh, image processing, you know that you always do you know, processing on a grid, right? I mean, that's, uh, that makes uh, sense. Um, but we didn't force the algorithm to choose the grid, right? We, we, we gave it freedom as long as it didn't use too many, uh, too many weights. So it had to be a sparse model, but it didn't have to be the grid. It just happens to find the grid, okay? Um, this is a you know, maybe more visually interesting result. We did the same thing with uh, texture images. So again, we extract patches from the texture images. And from those texture images, we, um, um, the, from those patches, we compute covariance matrices. And in the example from this image, this is the graph that is learned. Okay? So this, again, represents the pixels uh, in, in you know, um, eight by eight. Um, the, the edges that are blue indicate stronger connection, the green ones are lower connection. Okay? So now if you, if you look at this texture, you can see that the, tex the texture is uh, oriented vertically, right? 
And that's what the model learns, right? It shows that there are strong connections vertically. Now, if you take this texture and you rotate it, then what the model learns is also rotated. So you can see how there's, these connections go across diagonally. Okay? And so that's, uh, that's all learned from, from the data. Okay? So to summarize, um, we're able to learn a graph from data under different assumptions. You know, I, I didn't describe any of these in, in a lot of detail. We're approximating the inverse covariance. Um, and we can incorporate uh, structural constraints. So for example, if we have a prior on what the graph should be, we can incorporate that into, into our, our algorithm. And we, we can do this with uh, different diffusion operators, um, and we can learn graphs that have specific properties. Okay? And so these are examples where instead of selecting a graph based on distances or something that is given to us, what we do is analyze what is the best graph for the data. Okay? Um, Okay, so I think I'm uh, in a little bit early to leave time for questions. So uh, to conclude, uh, one thing that I didn't really say in a lot of detail is that um, uh, graph signal processing has uh, actually very deep roots in the, the signal processing community. I, I gave two examples, right, that if you, if you look at uh, a cycle graph or a line graph, those correspond, correspond to transforms that are very widely used. But th those are not the only examples. So for example, people have used uh, uh, graph-based methods for image segmentation. Um, in machine learning, people have used uh, graph representations for, for various purposes. And, and so it's not that we're um, you know, doing something that is radically different as much as we're taking several directions of work that were there and providing a, a more general interpretation and then using that to, to come up with new results. Um, in, Graph single processing, I've seen a lot of progress in recent years, so there's been a lot of interest, uh, publications, but um, there are lots of open questions, and I'm, I'm actually happy to you know, tell you some of, some of those open questions uh, um, at length. Um, <clears throat> what, what would be desirable outcomes, and maybe leading in you know, to some of these open questions? Um, first of all, a lot of what has been done so far works with relatively small graphs, you know, sensor graphs. And I think a question is how do you extend that to really large scale data sets, right? Maybe not Facebook scale graphs, but you know, graphs that are, um, you know, millions of nodes. Uh, how do you extend it computationally? How do the intuitions that you get from these, uh, the graph signal processing tools, uh, how do they translate to much larger scale um, uh, graphs? I think that one of the interesting conclusions for me has been that um, there's a lot of work where, that can go back where, uh, to existing applications, in particular in image and video processing, which is you know, kind of my original research area. You can go back and take these um, graph processing uh, approaches to come up with new ideas. And we have projects, um, we have a project with Google where we're looking at uh, uh, new transforms for video compression that uses these kinds of concepts. And I give you an example of this human activity analysis project also funded by, by uh, a company that, that tries to um, bring to existing applications you know, these, new, uh, these new ideas. There are also you know, promising results in machine learning um, and other areas. And um, we've applied uh, some of these methods to analyze deep networks. Uh, there's several groups that are uh, developing convolutional neural networks that, that apply to the uh, graph data. So I think there's, there's really a lot of you know, interesting um, uh, options here. And uh, I'll point you back to the three papers that, uh, that I mentioned earlier that give you know, introductions and have lots of references, in particular the one that uh, will appear in the Proceedings of the IEEE is uh, posted in our archive and it covers lots of different areas and uh, it, you know, it, it has probably four or five pages of references. So the, that's a good, very recent starting point if you want to explore. And so I'm going to stop a little bit early and uh, I'll be happy to take any questions. Uh, thank you very much. Interesting. This way. Okay. So uh, I have two questions. <laughs> uh, okay. So 
uh, about the formulation of the matrix to represent the graph. So uh -huh. uh, my first question is that how, why the diagonal must be formulated as a sum of the weight? Is that a must or is it just a choice? So it's kind of like a redundant information of the matrix, right? Yeah, so that's, that's a good question. So I didn't say a, a lot about that, uh, but um, so our definition of frequency is based on the Laplacian, so degree minus adjacency. So as you rightly point out, the degree is redundant with you know, the adjacency, right? All the information in the degree matrix is in the, the adjacency. So there are methods that use the adjacency matrix directly. Um, so using the Laplacian, one of the benefits is that you, know, you, you, you get this, um, the lowest frequency is, is all ones, which is a nice, um, in, uh, a nice thing. Uh, but some people use the, the adjacency. In fact, if you have directed graphs, which again, I didn't discuss in detail, the, the matrices are no longer symmetric and uh, you can no longer guarantee that it will have eigenvectors, let alone orthogonal eigenvectors. And for um, the directed graphs, um, most people start with the adjacency, right? And I also didn't say that you, know, you have um, alternatives that are normalized versions of the Laplacian. But the, the Laplacian is the, the, the one that was used in uh, spectral graph theory, uh, that, you know, where spectral graph theory essentially tries to um, infer the, the characteristics, the structure of the, of the graph from the, um, the spectrum, from the eigenvectors. And so a lot of spectral graph theory was built around the graph Laplacian. But you're right, there are other options, and uh, in particular, the adjacency matrix is one. My other question is that uh, how, when the uh, definition of the frequency and the result from transformation, when the loss, uh, loss uh, result sensitive to the ordering of, to the, uh, to the ordering of the vertices when you formulate the matrix. For example, you have node one to node n, and you can formulate an equivalent matrix from node n to node one. So while the letter order is sensitive to the result. Okay, so that's another good, good question. So the, <clears throat> the node labeling doesn't matter. So ba basically, all the information about the graph is captured in the matrices. And so if I decide, you know, if you give me a graph where node one is this one, node 20 is that one, and I said, no, 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 this has to be the reverse. Basically, all I'm doing is permuting the matrices. And I will permute the, the signals and so nothing, nothing really changes. So the labeling itself doesn't matter. Uh, for the classification part, you were saying the lowest frequencies, which accounts for the 10% of the energy, is enough to classify our data with 90% accuracy. How do, we decide, how do we decide the energy? Is it the... Uh, so, so in this case, the, the energy is simply the, um, um, it's the energy, so when, so, so let's say I do the following, I choose 10% uh, of the nodes, right? And then I observe the label in those 10% of the nodes, and let's say it might be, you know, dog, no dog, right? I mean, that's all I know in, in that task. And then I, I use a filter to interpolate, and then I compare the signal that I get, the interpolated signal, with the true labels and I computed a Euclidean distance between those two vectors. That's, that's the energy that I'm comparing, right? So how, how close I am to you know, the, true, the true value, so the error, the, the quadratic error. Yeah. Um, you showed a um, stick figure moving, uh, yeah. and you showed a couple of signals. Uh, do those, you showed two signals, I think. Yes. Yes. Do those two signals contain all the information? Can you reconstruct no. the image from, no? No, the, these, these two signals were, basically what, what we did in that case was when we, when we run the video analysis algorithm, it gives, it gives us a position of each joint, right? So it tells us at each point the, the, the algorithm detects what is the, the most likely position of each uh, joint. And then we create uh, motion so by, by looking at the same joint over consecutive times, we have a motion vector. Um, and then we filter that information 
by projecting it onto each of these basis vectors. And so the two that I showed are two that capture a lot of the energy, but not all the energy. Right? And in fact, in that case, the tasks were rather simple. Um, and we want, just wanted to demonstrate that you can segment the motion. The segmentation itself used all the vectors. Right? Um, but uh, yeah, so the short answer is no. You know, there, there was more information that was capturing all the ones. The, the, you know, I may, may say a little bit about the application that this uh, company is interested in, and you know, maybe it's a little bit, uh, I, don't know, I, I won't use a, an adjective for this, but you know, they, they want to monitor uh, people who are working on a task, and they want, they want to know if they're being efficient, or maybe they, they, they're not following the instructions very well, by, by just maintaining, by, by capturing motion and then segmenting it into, um, you know, s separate motions, and let's say you're assembling a toy, for example. Then you start assembling it. Uh, you, you, know, you have different parts of the assembly, and then you're, you're finished and you start again. Right? So they want to monitor. Um, they want to at least uh, assess how, how good the motion was by, by, by using video. Um, other applications that may be <clears throat> in uh, applications in, I don't know, transportation or brain uh, activity, fMRI, that type of thing, are there other uh, hot uh, areas of application to graph signal process? Yeah, so, so I mean, I can go through a list that, you know, maybe it's not going to be comprehensive, and I, I, I think, you know, the, uh, when I've talked to various people and given talks on this topic, a question that comes up uh, quite often is what's the, what's the killer app, right? You know, what's, what's the, the application uh, that makes a difference where you know, these things really um, uh, make a big difference? And I think my, my, my answer to that is that uh, I think that there's a lot in the application that somebody who comes in from, the outside, the, from outside the application domain really cannot solve by just by bringing a method, right? So I think to, to work in an application, that's been my experience with various projects, you really have to go in depth. You have to work with experts, you have to try things, you have to analyze. And so I can only really speak about, you know, with some confidence about applications that I've worked on myself, but I can give you uh, examples, you know, uh, Alejandro Ribeiro, just up the road uh, from here, uh, has been looking at brain networks, for example, and uh, he has a collaboration with Danny Bassett that also at UPenn. Um, I've seen um, a work work at uh, Texas A&M where they were looking at uh, traffic data. Um, they were analyzing traffic in I think Dallas, and they had a, a big data set. They associated the the traffic intensity, the measurements of uh, you know number of cars uh, passing through intersections to the road network, and they were doing some analysis of that. Um, one thing that, that, they, that they were doing that was kind of interesting is they, they will look at uh, the state of the network at, at time t and then time t plus one, and they looked at anomalies, you know, in, in you know, when, when you cannot predict t plus one from t, and they found that almost always that was an accident, right? So it's not, not very surprising, but if you have you know, if the, the traffic is flowing in a certain way, you can predict what's happening next from what's just happened. But if it's an accident, all of a sudden, uh, something unpredictable, you know, happened. Uh, I think there's been work on sensor networks as, as well. Um, in fact, uh, I got into this topic from my own work in sensor networks, and we were doing transformations on sensors, and then we, we learned how to do transformations that worked on trees. And then we asked the question, what about more general graphs? And that's how you know, we got into this. Um, I think some of the you know, recent things that I've seen that, that are also interesting, um, um, I mentioned in, during my talk, uh, for data sets that are defined on graphs, you know, maybe social data or sensor data, where the data set itself is captured on a graph. Um, these kinds of ideas allow you to, to extend convolutional neural networks to, um, to graph data sets. And so there's been an interest in, in you know, basically replicating what some of these deep networks do by replacing the standard convolution in signal processing by filters on graphs. Okay, and that, that, that can be done. And the last one I would mention 
sort of looking at things the opposite in you know, the other way, we've looked at uh, neural networks and we're trying to analyze uh, their properties and when they overfit by analyzing how they transform the data set through a graph signal processing perspective. So I, I don't know that there is a, you know, a killer app. I would say that in the area that I know the best you know, from the work that I did before, which is image and video coding, there's very interesting new ideas that you can um, bring to that area. Um, but of course, in video coding, it's kind of a mature topic, and, and uh, there's a lot of, you know, a lot of effort is needed to, to, to get you a 1% improvement, let's say. So. OK, any, any last uh, questions? I was, I was going to suggest uh, a question in the back. I wanted to see Gonzalo's throwing arm, you know. Uh, so. Hi. So from what I understood, most of these signals are deterministic. Is there an approach to process the random signals? Yeah, so that's a really a, also a very good question. So um, so the, there's work in, you know, in, in fact, the, 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 there's work in, um, at UPenn, uh, Ribeiro's group and uh, Santiago Segarra, I think he visited recently, uh, that, uh, that has looked at that. And I think what, what makes it difficult um, is to, um, so for example, you may want to design, to define what it means for a signal on a graph to be stationary, right? And so the approach that many of these uh, papers have uh, followed is to think of the, uh, the adjacency as a shift operator on the graph. And so basically, if you, if you shift the signal on the graph, you're basically multiplying by the adjacency. Okay? And so then, then the uh, stationarity property of these random signals has to do with how they're, if they're stationary in the graph, it means that they have some invariance with respect to shifts that correspond to multiplying by the adjacency. Um, so that's, that's one approach. I think what, um, what's a little bit you know, up to discussion but for, for that approach is uh, to what extent the, the adjacency is really a shift, right? So when, I, when we think in, in signal processing about uh, a shift operation, we think about uh, something that is reversible, right? I can shift forward and back and I get back what I, what I had. Um, and adjacency symmetrics may not be invertible, right? So you cannot shift back. Uh, also, if you shift uh, and you're, you have a circular um, graph, you know, you go back to where you started. Again, in a, in, a, in a regular graph, you don't have that. So I think it's, to me, personally, that's an open question. And I think it's a very interesting open question. Um, we're uh, doing some work that, that tries to go back to maybe more intuitive notions of stationarity. Um, by comparing different parts of the graph signal in different parts of the network. But uh, a, lot, a lot of the work that has been done is based on this analogy, uh, adjacency equals shift. And a lot of that is derived from this. Very well. Um, before we close the, uh, the lecture, I want to announce that there's a reception in, uh, across the, 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 the green in Evans Hall, the first floor. Uh, the, Collaboration suite, so please join, uh, join us to uh, this uh, uh, networking and, and just uh, uh, reception. But we, with that, I'd like to thank uh, Antonio for- Thank you. <laughs>